All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Nat, and welcome to the iconic Thursday webinars at Exceptional Individuals. We deliver these thought-provoking sessions every week to try and get all of us thinking, pulling apart, and really understanding what it means to be neurodivergent in a neurotypical world. And with that, we touch upon subjects such as history, the future, um, symptoms, characteristics, support strategies, the whole kit caboodle. Oh, nice. Janice says, oh, from Surrey and has bipolar and a daughter, who, um, a daughter and autistic grandson. Well, great to have you. And I'm hopefully today we'll help. Though we are focusing on mental health today, as I've said, being neurodivergent is challenging and unfortunately, the likelihood of having a co-occurring mental health condition is quite high. Um, I myself um, am dyslexic and dyspraxic and have um, uh, on the autistic spectrum. But those things in themselves, I don't think has actually ever been that debilitating to me. But it's the kind of the pressures of kind of conforming, which has made my life more challenging as a result, or at least from what I see as a direct result, I have OCD. And I do see it being very strongly connected to the autistic characteristics. And it's with the OCD, in which I experience support um, through the health system in the UK. Now, whether or not I had a good experience is hard to say. Ultimately, they did help me, but that journey in order to get help was a long, long journey. So I'm really hoping today we can share best practice, share our experiences, and go from there. Oh, Tom says, I relate, I relate quite a lot to what you're saying. I appreciate it, Tom. It's always great to know that you're not alone. Because in the very moment when you're in the belly of the storm, as they say, I think they say that, it can feel quite isolating. And when you're in your like absolute darkest part, you're not bothered about integrating with the community. So I'm hoping a lot of you who are here kind of preparing for like resilience for tomorrow, or have come out of that kind of really dark patch. Because though we might be talking about things quite general today, there also might be some triggering elements. So do keep that in mind if you are currently really struggling. Oh, Donna says, hi all, attending to learn more about mental health and supporting all those struggling with mental health in my personal and professional capacity. That's great. So while I said we are talking about mental health in general, we are gonna be coming on under a particular focus on how it might relate to being neurodivergent. Now, a little bit about exceptional individuals. We're a small social enterprise and we have been supporting people since 2015 to not just understand how their mind works, but how to utilize how their mind works for the better. Now, this could be in their personal life, professional life. And on the professional side, we also work with organizations to really tap in to what makes us brilliant, but also support us in the areas which are a bit more challenging. So today we've got myself in the chat, we've got April in the chat, and we also have Kinga. So do reach out for any questions if you have them as we go along. Now, as I rightly mentioned, we do deliver webinars nearly every week, unless uh, I'm ill. That's basically it. And the last one we did was the societal strain of neurodiversity. Now, this was a really big subject. And people getting their pitchforks out and saying, boo, you're saying that we're adrenal resources. That wasn't what I was saying. Watch the webinar. But in short, it's about understanding that supporting neurodiverse person in a neurotypical uh, environment does equal cost. It does more time, more energy. These things are undeniable. But we also looked about the benefit it brings to society as well. So we're trying to kind of zoom out and look at a more three-dimensional view on the cost of being neurodivergent, but also the benefit that it brings. It wasn't as kind of clear-cut. So this isn't a negative webinar by any means. It's hopefully quite a well-balanced one. So do check it out if you're able to. Just go to our YouTube channel. Now, the recovery paradigm. What does it even mean? A paradigm, you know, is kind of like an idea, a concept. Um, a movement. And you might think recovery, is that even a thing? <laughs> well, people didn't even believe in mental health before. And then when they did, there was no way they thought you could cure it. Nowadays, it's more not much about curing, it's more about 
finding ways to live with it or to manage it. It's a complex area, really. And I would love to know your thoughts and opinions. Can you cure mental health or is it something you learn to live with? Is it a little bit of both? Um, How different or not different is it to physical health? These are all uh, questions which I don't think have a definitive answer. So I would love to know your thoughts and opinions. So today, if we are successful, we're hopefully going to be looking at what even is this paradigm you speak of. We're going to be looking at the difference between personal and clinical recovery. This is really important because you you might personally say, I'm better, but the doctor's like, you're not. Or you might be like, I know I'm still not okay, but the NHS has signed me off with a clean bill of health. So sometimes our personal view of what good health looks like and the clinical one don't always match up. Recovery, promoting interventions. This is looking at what's in the, uh, in the community um, and also what's currently going on recent developments. And I don't know about any of you, but I found the future to be a very optimistic place when I was really at my lowest because the current services that were on offer just weren't helping me. They weren't ridding me of this debilitating condition. But the idea that just around the corner, you know, maybe, you know, just a couple of months or a few years, not long at all, there might be some kind of a miracle thing. Now, whether or not that was naive of me to think, it did kind of help me stay optimistic and kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. Or Lucy says it really much depends on the illness. And that is true as well. Because as I often say, when it comes to talking around neurodivergent, whether or not you consider it a disability, one, it it depends on where you live in the world. It depends on how it affects you. It depends exactly what comorbidities you have as well. It's very difficult to say. I know with my OCD, I would call, I would say it is in mild remittance. So while I am still very conscious and aware of its existence, it doesn't stop me from living my best life on the whole but that isn't something which you know goes up and down up and down now to understand what why we're talking about recovery we do have to go back in time a little bit so in the dark days um prior the 60s i love the 60s i wasn't born then but i love the music and the beatles but truthfully it wasn't the best time to have a mental health condition because before then you're in insane asylums or kind of mental health or like just big institutions. And these were places where if you had a mental, well, after the days of being a witch, eventually they realized something's not right here. What we're going to do, we're going to put them all in a big building and support them there. Now, I would love to know your thoughts. Was this a good thing or a bad thing? It's not as easy to answer when you really dive in deep. Obviously, we would say a bad thing, because when we look at TV shows, it's always about like American horror story and insane asylums. But it was one area where it was the sole focus to support people. There was actually money and resources behind supporting people who struggled with mental health. But then after the 60s, essentially, uh, we were bankrupt. There was no money. We needed to do something. How can we spin this in order to make it a positive? Ah, health in the community. Let's get people out of these institutions, put them in the community and let, you know, your neighbor Karen look after you. In some ways that was great because it allowed people to live as normal life as they possibly could. It gave them a more real human one-to-one. On the other side, it meant that there weren't hospital beds available should people need them. So the deinstitutionalization, oh, that's a big word, was very much a double edged sword. On one hand, it was a move between a more holistic type of care and love. And on the other hand, it was essentially the government cheaping out on us and saying we can't really afford to look after you anymore. So really uh, an interesting time. And whether or not I think you have a good view or a bad view on it can depend a lot. A lot of people who were around during Maggie Thatcher's time uh, might have very different views as well on it. So here's a question to all of you. What does recovery mean for you? Tom says institutionalization may not necessarily always be a bad thing. It's the quality of care slash treatment that's important. 
Absolutely, Tom. You know, in the right kind of scenario, if you gave me the choice between quality care and institution or quality care in my community, I'll always pick my community. It's just these community were under-resourced, underfunded, understaffed, and they just didn't have the capacity and they weren't equipped to support people with higher needs. So I completely agree with you. So yeah, the question, what does recovery mean for you? Let's have a look what some of you have answered. Recovery from an illness or injury. So, okay, I, don't, I want a bit more. Dive in a bit deeper. We've got feeling cons uh, consistently more positive. I like that because being depressed isn't a mental illness, but being depressed for a considerable amount of time, that's depression. So, yeah, the time scale is also a really important element. To understand your story and to learn skills to help you manage it in the future. Yep. Again, this is appreciating that we aren't just good, not good. You know, we go ups and downs. But are you able to ride that storm? For instance, when I have my episodes, they're probably just as bad as they've always been. But the difference is I have an understanding about what's going on in my mind. It gives me almost like a playbook in order to best help myself. We got recovery would be self-confidence to be able to manage yourself, emotions and energy. Yes, I like that. That's another good one. Getting back to a level of normal. And obviously normal is individual. But for instance, is it just kind of waking up each day, going to the shops, pottering about, phoning someone? Then that's normal. Improvement in daily functioning and ability to plan future work towards my goals. Yes, future is also, again, really important. I often find when you are really struggling with mental health, I'm not saying it's necessarily su suicidal thoughts, but it is still very challenging to see beyond your current state. I know when I would get in a right state, there was no way I could imagine this ever going away. And though I had no need or ambition or want to like not live anymore, I still found tomorrow quite a daunting concept. We've got stronger resilience, coping strategies and effective support networks. I don't know because I don't think I've ever recovered. And you know what? Can you actually ever recover? That is an interesting one. And I don't know because I don't think you're ever the same again. But that doesn't have to be a negative. You know, your experiences do shape your outlook. And maybe would recovery means it would undo all of that learning and development. I don't know. You've got being able to cope better with having your difficulties, having more good days and bad days. Yes, that is another good one when you know, you know it's that kind of tipping point. So we're not trying to rid whatever we might consider an illness or a disability or illness. We're just trying to minimize the impact and not let it kind of consume us. We've got Donna says recovery would be self-confidence, being able to manage your self-emotions energy. Really great. Honestly, thank you, everyone. These are really great um, views and opinions. Being able to cope better with your difficulties, having more good days. Now, one of the go-to definitions on what recovery is, is by a guy called William Anthony, who's, I think it's the Boston University or Institutional Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation. So it's a bit old now, 1993, but this guy has been quoted more times than I can count. Um, probably more than three. <laughs> he says, recovery is described as a deeply personal, unique process of changing one's attitudes, values, and feelings, goals, skills, and or roles. It is a way of living a satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life, even with limitations caused by illness. This is powerful, and I'm going to re-say it because I think it really helps sticks in. And I think a lot of us was onto the right kind of wavelength. Recovery isn't about like ridding or kind of completely removing that kind of block in your life forever. Recovery is described as deeply personal. So one person's recovery is very different to another person's recovery. You can't universally say these people have recovered. It has to be from a person perspective. A unique process. So again, looks different for everyone of changing one's attitude. So if you change your attitude, maybe you have recovered. So for instance, if you have something which is lifelong, is, you know, you can't really recover, but you can change your outlook on it. 
I will also always have OCD, but rather than seeing it as kind of despair, I see it as, I don't know how I see it, but I don't see it as such negative as I used to. When we refer to being neurodivergent, like autism, dyslexia, et cetera, et cetera, it is lifelong. And whether or not you see it as a disability, well, yes, it does society and how they treat you have a big part to play in it. But ultimately, it's how you internalize it and your view sets, our values, our feelings, our goals, our skills and our roles. It is a way of living a satisfying, hopeful and contributing life. So are you able to benefit to society and see reason and hope for living? So we know there's always amazing, like inspirational people who have like the most horrendous conditions or like illnesses or things in their life. But they are able to give so much to the world, not because of their difference, but despite of it um, or because of it. Uh, with limitations caused by illnesses. And again, limitations means maybe you're not able to do things at the same level that you used to, or maybe compared to other people, but you're still able to find ways around it. Okay. Oh, Anna says that element of contribution feels super important. It gives the hope and helps you define your goals, make you feel connected and value. I think so too. Like if I was to honestly really dig in deep to why I work at exceptional individuals and support neurodiverse people, truthfully, it's because when I was younger, I saw being different as a really negative thing. And I thought, you know what, if I have to struggle, damn it, I want to make sure my life is able to contribute to someone's life, even just a tiny little bit. Now that thought process has shifted. But I probably will say, you know, that's kind of what got me through the day. Every time I was bullied or discriminated or kind of felt stupid or dumb, knowing that one day I'll try and use these experiences to make someone else suffer just a little bit less was honestly a real driving factor. Again, I might not see it that way anymore. But those feelings were very real back then anyway. We got feeling better and getting back to a state of normality. Yes, I completely agree. So quick question, what is the most challenging part of recovering from mental ill health? Is it the stigma that is involved with it? Is it the lack of opportunities or is it the side effects of the medication if you're on the medication? So the most challenging part of recovering from mental ill health. So let's see. Ooh. Stigma. <laughs> yeah, stigma. Uh, from this small demographic decided that that is the most challenging part so it isn't the condition in itself it is how people around us treat us and i would say that's quite true there is also lack of opportunities there are things that do kind of stop you from doing other things also medication does have side effects did you know one of the biggest side effects from antidepressant medication is uh I don't know the scientific term, so excuse me, but uh, underperformance in the bedroom, also excessive weight gain, um, like low appetite, you know, th these things which in the short term, who cares? I just want to get better. But in the long term, these are things which might really push your life back. Yes, Lucy says, loss of libido. <laughs> Thanks. I know, again, we joke because it's like, oh, you know, but the thing is, it's real. Uh, and these are things which in the short term might not be that big of a deal but we always have to ask the question what is the long-term implications and are we okay with that but stigma is something which i think let's say we lived in a very great community where people understood and had a high level of empathy i think you know no matter what you had in life it would be a lot lot easier so now let's go to the battle personal versus clinical recovery. You'd like to think they're on the same page, they are not. What is one person's view of recovery to someone else's completely different? The reason, you know, from a personal perspective, it's great when you have that self-confidence to say, I'm in a place in my life where I feel that I can manage these intrusive thoughts or whatever you have. But it's also important to understand the clinical definition, because let's take uh, antidepressants, for example. Let's say, OK, suddenly you've been taking them for a few weeks. You feel better. Woohoo! I'm going to stop taking pills. Makes sense, right? Well, studies have shown that 
you're more likely to get severely depressed after stopping medication straight away. It's why you've kind of got to ease off of it bit by bit. So I'm not saying clinicians oh, cannot help you in these things. It is a kind of a journey of working together. I'm so glad, for instance, that when I felt better, I didn't stop taking my medication because, you know, I, I don't think I was mentally prepared for the drop. So it's really important that even if you are feeling better, before you make any rash decisions, have that open discussion with your GP or medical professional. So clinical v. personal, measured by professionals. Who does that refer to? Recovery is a continuum, meaning it never really ends. It's an ongoing thing. Consistence between individuals and emphasis on hope and empowerment. OK, brilliant. Yeah, nice and simple, thankfully. You've been paying attention on the whole. So measured by professionals, that is a clinician. A clinician is a professional. They're trained, they're qualified. They know what they're talking about in a more wider sense. Understanding that recovery is ongoing. We never really reach that kind of end goal. It's something that we're always working towards. Well, I can see this as a bit of a mixed one. This is more related to the personal view of recovery. A clinician, while I'm sure if you ask them personally, they would very much say it's ongoing. For them, you know, you're on the books, you're off the books. You need support, you currently don't need support. So it is more of a kind of yes or no way on the whole. But again, challenge me on that if you think different. We've got consistent between individuals. So that means is, is it pretty regular? Now, yes, that is a clinical idea. They do have to standardize things. They will say, you know, do you have this? Do you do this? You know, when you do these things like, are you currently thinking of harming yourself? Do you currently feel low? You know, they are very straightforward, but a more personal perspective would dig in a lot deeper and understanding what they mean for you. And lastly, an emphasis on hope and empowerment. From a clinical perspective, it is a negative thing that we want to get rid of and we're done. From a personal perspective, it's looking about how have this struggle, this journey benefited you? What have you gained from it? How has it changed your outlook on life? So these two different types of recovery, though they can complement each other, they are often quite like, again, butting heads. Back to a question to all of you lovely people. What words come to mind when you think of personal recovery? So maybe it's the first time you've heard of it. Maybe you're a pro at it. Any kind of words that kind of come to your mind. And it'd be really interesting to see if it, we think this is positive, negative, real, not real, beneficial, not beneficial. So we're going back here to the deinstitutionalization. Was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? Is it better that we're taking more accountability for our own personal recovery? Or is this just an example of cost cutting and actually no perceived real benefits? OK, we've got struggle. We've got long. We've got hard. Uh, we've got peace. These are really interesting because, again, it is a long journey. And, you know, if you were to tell someone at the lowest, this journey doesn't have an end point, it's ongoing, maybe that's not the most kind of like inspirational. It's true, but it's interesting. We got less sadness, support from loved ones. I like that. That's a different like positive angle on it. Rebuilding, rebuilding stronger. Empowerment, positive sense to self. Yes, you have that kind of ownership. Forgiveness, Nina. I like that. That's a really great one as well. So as we can see, there are a mixture of positive and not positive, holistic. That's a really great one. So kind of a nice, softer approach. Support from loved one. Yeah, these are really nice. Making the most of my spikes. Yes. So we know that we have high and low spikes and being able to see the benefit. Uh, more control. Yes. The ability to move on. These are really great. Thanks, everyone, for sharing on these. More control. Nice. So here are some of like the key points to a personal recovery. And as you can see, we've referenced them all up here. So uh, not just my views. Can personal recovery be all of these and more? So personal recovery, 
is a personal recovery can involve many different experiences, challenges and triumphs and is unique to each individual. So it is not a one size fits all. It's an active process, meaning you are always doing it. You never really finish the recovery process, though it will change over time and arguably it will get easier. It is individual and unique. There isn't just a guidebook. If you ever get these like books about helping you with personal recovery, a lot of them are thought provoking questions which encourage you to think that they, they can't just tell you the answer. It's non-linear. It isn't like unwell, well, you know, you are going to go back and forth. You know, the old expression, you know, two step, as it one step forward, two steps back. Sometimes it can feel like that. Relapse is perfectly normal and honestly quite expected when it comes to recovery. No professionals needed. No, it's not saying you will not have professionals. You can do it on your own. It could be family and friends. It's more about having that empathetic um, understanding rather than someone who is able to prescribe medication. And it's trial and error. Unfortunately, this is very true. Not everything's going to work. And often it's a cocktail. Yeah, I found this works a little bit for me. This works well. You know, going to support groups where you kind of get to know what has worked for other people really helps. It can be a bit, you know, ugh, when you realize you try, like, I've tried that, I've tried that, I've tried that. But you do have to stay open minded because one thing may just be that thing that unlocks um, and kind of allows you to be a bit more free. Now, have any of you heard of CHIME? It is a method of recovery. What elements have the biggest in effect on recovery? So CHIME is broken down to connectedness, hope, identity, meaning in life, and empowerment. These are kind of like a good kind of all around use on the recovery process. But do you think any of these have the biggest impact on your own personal recovery if you have also been through a similar journey. So connectedness, meaning you do not feel alone, you feel a part of something. You know, we're all in this together, even if we're going through different journeys. Hope is knowing that things will get better. You aren't stuck in this one point in time. And all the others have disappeared, so I can't see them now, but they'll come back. Yes, empowerment, this is showing that you are more than just your illness. You are able to overcome things. Again, are much more optimistic. Chime is used quite often when it comes to understanding how we can overcome things. Each element of chime plays an important role in the recovery process. However, research suggests that connectedness and social support may have the biggest effect on recovery. That's interesting that what this is saying is, Connectedness and social support is more important, but yet most of you have said either empowerment or hope, and we've even got meaning in life now to so some sort of purpose that drives you. As we can tell, it's an individual thing, very personal. Now, what about the misconceptions? Misconceptions about personal recovery. We all have our views, our thoughts and opinions. Some are just that, but there are facts and faults within them. So hopefully we can debunk a little bit. On here, I want you to say if you think it's true or false. And once you have rated all of these, we'll see which one is correct or not correct. We've got mental health orgs, higher peer workers are recovery orientated. The recovery paradigm is for psychosis. Treatment services foster recovery. Compulsory treatment aids recovery. Recovery equals independent and normal. The paradigm of recovery equals closing services. Okay, that's interesting. So these are things that a lot of people often have very strong views on, which aren't probably necessarily correct. So let's see what we're dealing with here. False, 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 false. They're all false. Who would have known? So mental health organizations hire peer workers that are recovery orientated. Not always the case. It's a mixed bag. We've got the recovery paradigm is for psychosis. Definitely not. It works across the board. Treatment services foster recovery. Not necessarily. Compulsory treatment aids recovery. Definitely not. It doesn't always help. Recovery equals independent and normal. No, though that might be what we're aiming for. That isn't necessarily what it is. 
for some people, it's just about gaining an element of control and normacy, but it might not be exactly what you want. And also the idea of recovery and community support is not about closing services. A very skeptical view of it, as I mentioned at the very start of the session, could be that, but that isn't what it's about at all. I'm not saying it hasn't fed into it in some shape or form at the beginning, but these are all misconceptions. So if we are successful in this section, we have learned the following. We learned what personal recovery is. Hopefully we've learned what it isn't. We learned the difference between personal recovery and clinical recovery. We learned a little bit about the recovery journey, you know, when we looked at Chime, and a bit about misconceptions. We're now going to look at interventions. We talked a bit about what recovery is and what it isn't, but now let's look at how we can actually go about this journey. How do we get our foot on the ladder? So we're going to be looking at peer support, wellness recovery planning, management and recovery and individual support. You know, I've had a mixed bag in terms of how effective this has, and it definitely has probably tarnished me in terms of my views on getting similar support in the future. And I'm hoping that that isn't always going to be the case because it can be really beneficial. And if any of you have personal experiences or peer support, I genuinely would love to hear about it. So have you ever had peer support before? I would love to know. Again, peer support is often when someone who has experienced something very similar to you is also trying to support you. Maybe they're a little bit further in their journey than you are, or maybe you're both on the journey, but kind of experiencing different parts. Exceptional individuals is based on peer support saying we're experts via experience first and foremost, and then we're like scientific or medical professional secondary. Okay, so some of you, yes, some of you, no, nearly 50-50. And getting this support, one, might be easier to get than getting medical help, particularly on NH NHS, but also can be really beneficial because we can feel very alone and isolated. So what do support peer support specialists do slash your experience with them? If you have had it, what has it looked like? Has it worked for you? Has it not worked for you? And if you haven't ever had peer support, what do you think they actually do? Do we sit in a circle holding hands saying Kumbaya or are we actively working together going through booklets? Is it just regular chats? Is it an accountability partner? It really does work different for everyone. I remember I had um, CBT um, where you have like the therapy, like talking therapy and you work through your challenges. It took me a while to uh, adopt warm up to it, to be honest with you. I thought it was all like hocus pocus. Um, now I see the benefit of it. I really do. But I think I only had 15 minutes once a week for six weeks. Honestly, wasn't enough. So I can definitely see the benefit in that approach. I just wish that there was maybe more resources where I was, which would allow me to have that support. We've got, so peer support specialists, they're there to listen. Yes, they don't have the answers. Often when it comes to like peer support or life coaches, the idea is they are not the experts. All they are, are the people who ask the probing questions in order for you to answer the, the, the questions you already have answers in your head, but maybe you've just been afraid to go there. I found that quite interesting. As a stubborn old goat, <laughs> I don't always like being told what to do, but if that is kind of like brought out of me, I'm far more likely to kind of adopt it and believe in it. We've got never tried it, but would give it a go. And I think that is the thing. One thing I have learned, it only works if you're willing to give it a go. If you are being really stubborn, you will not get the benefit from it. Not always ND aware if done for depression or anxiety. Unfortunately, that is true. The support I had was not uh, tailored for my neurodivergence, and even they admitted that themselves. And as a result, I don't think it was as beneficial as it could have been. I'd imagine it's talking with others like you. Yes. Now, Sometimes it can be a mixture, like the people I did, they were in the community, so it was an official service. They were people who had had training, but they weren't doctors. So it was kind of in the middle between just someone who has that understanding, but also someone who has had some training. So in a nutshell, so peer support workers do the following. 
they use their own recovery story to support you. You know, I get it. I've been there. I've experienced it. It's different to yours, but at least I can put myself in your shoes. They listen to others' life experience. They are willing to listen, hopefully not interrupt, and be there throughout that journey. They share what was helpful in their journey, identify beliefs that hold peers back. This is a really crucial part as well. They share their tools for taking self-care, help peers with recovery goals, transform disillusionments into motivations, and teach peers to advocate for their rights. So quite often, it's about reframing. How can you take what you currently believe and turn it on its head or pull apart it? Sometimes our beliefs are based in reality and truth, and other times there are not. And it's about growing that skill set to determine what is factual and what is just our own perception. This is something which is I'm still on a journey with, but it is really helpful. If I think they're all talking about me, everybody hates me, that is an assumption. Then I need to pull it back. Well, why do I think everyone hates me? What have they done which has shown that they hate me? What about what has shown me that they like me and that they care for me? You know, it's really about being a bit more like analytical with your own experiences. So do peer support specialists actually work? It's a mixed bag. There's no straightforward answer. There's in a lot of research, there has been no difference in several outcomes. So whether or not you have a medical intervention or a peer support one, no difference. Also, care from peer from peers used crisis services less. So this is a really good one. So, you know, crisis services, so when you have to phone 999 or you have to kind of go people who are on like 24-7 watch, people who have had that one-to-one support with a peer have used those services less. So that's a win. We also got improved empowerment and recovery. So people tend to be more comfortable with it, more open, more talking. So it's interesting. On one hand, though, not many outputs. On the other, yes, they have. So it's not a resounding yes, but it's definitely not a no. Or Anna says, I found therapists who are ND themselves the best. And I think that's good because you also believe in them as well. You're like, all right, at least they get it to a certain extent. Moving on, we've got RAP. <laughs> Wellness Recovery Action Plan. These are often like a framework which is done with group interventions to facilitate peers. If any of you have experienced RAP, let me know. Um, I think I have done like a hybrid version of it, but not this particular model. And it's a recovery plan that typically comprises to eight to 10 weekly sessions. I did mine on a one-to-one. I didn't do it as a group session, but it's a really interesting way on which can aid into recovery. And remember, recovery isn't ridding. It's about living with and still being able to be you. So what tools and strategies have you used for well-being? Before I kind of break down a bit more what RAP is, I would love to know what has worked for you in the past. I can see uh, Anna says like a therapist, others just like peace and forgiveness to yourself. Um, For me, medication has helped. But I think more importantly, it was having someone who actually believed in me, who didn't take my uh, cries for help as crying for wolf. They were people who really listened to me and that helped me a lot. Exercise, I couldn't agree more. I'm not someone who practices in it, but I wish I did. Uh, When I do exercise, I feel so much better. When I go out in nature, you know, when I eat healthy, the like the bare necessities of living well, who would have thought actually have an impact? We got prioritizing your needs. A break from social media. Yeah, Selena Gomez did it and it worked for her. Therapy, playing sports, yoga, exercise, self-love, a break from email, setting boundaries, mindfulness, talking. Have you noticed most of these are free or very low cost? So really great strategies. Common tools to strategies, promote well health because exercise, mindfulness, meditation, therapy, whatever you call it. I was very reluctant at first to do meditation because I thought it was like all religious-y and monkey. <laughs> like, I'm not monkey, you know, like monks. Um, But then when you use the word mindfulness, they're very much the same thing, aren't they, in my opinion, or maybe my simplistic view of it. But actually just sometimes changing the words of it can give you that different view that actually it's okay. If someone said to me, I'm doing meditation on mindfulness, I'd be like, no. But if they said, take five minutes and just think about your thoughts and understanding how you're feeling, like, yeah, I'm okay with that. So language 
can also play a big part. Oh, uh, James says getting your ND diagnosis. Yes, that is another good one as well. Now, there are some kind of guidebooks. A real common one is the IMR, IMR, the Illness Management and Recovery Book. It's a beastie book, but it's a program which a lot of kind of professionals, particularly peer to peer ones, use. It's a program that teaches people with mental illness strategies to manage their own symptoms and help them achieve their own personal recovery goals. This isn't a book of telling you how to get better. It's a book which gives you the tools in order for you to get better on your own or as part of a supportive network. So here, what IMR modules would you find most interesting? So all of these are different chapters in this beastie book, which people use in order to support their own recovery. It isn't the type of book where you've got to read start to finish. It's one where you kind of pick and choose and you kind of find the elements and use that. We've got recovery. We've got facts about mental illness. If you're someone like myself who's very science focused, knowing the facts really helps me buy into it. If you just say do mindfulness, whatever. If you say do mind this because it has been proven to help these people and it has had these impacts, suddenly mentally I'm on board. We've got stress uh, vulnerability module, building a social support, using medication effectively. Yes, one of the biggest reasons for people um, relapsing is not effectively using the medication they're on. It goes back to the point, if you stop using medication when you start on having a good day, that could lead to a much worse day tomorrow. Drugs and alcohol, reducing relapses, coping with stress, really big one. Did stress exist thousands of years ago, or is it just our modern world which has created it? Coping with persistent symptoms, the mental health system, living a healthy lifestyle. So not a great, a big sample size, but the majority have said coping with persistent symptoms. Yes. This is something which was very helpful when I had my... And it's Hana, it's Fazana. Fazana. Yeah, I just, I just want to say, we never heard of the word anxiety, frustration, stress. Good 25 years ago, it didn't even exist. So I think it is to do with the modern, uh, the modern, the modern, modern world we live in. Mm, yeah, the modern world has definitely contributed to stress and that's something which we can't change the world we live in we are kind of required to required to be on social media and required to check our emails but are we able to kind of create a more of a healthier balance i completely agree with you the other book which is worth looking into is the individual placement and support it's called the ips really commonly used it aims at helping people with mental illness to get and keep jobs in mainstream and competitive markets so what this book essentially does is yep the mental illness is always going to be there even if it's under the surface but how can you live your best life with these things so for instance you know rather than just saying you know sitting on the sofa feeling sorry for yourself how are you able to reframe your thoughts even if you can't currently rid yourself of whatever is being the debilitating factor. Again, when I had really severe headaches, as much as I'd like to sit on the couch and cry all day, I still had to earn a living. So how was I able to do both, like kind of manage my health and also earn a living at the same time? Uh, Jane says, do any of these books have ND sections? No, um, not to my knowledge, at least. And I know what you're saying. Oh, that's not good enough. I know. Unfortunately, what I've had to do is use these books as a foundation and then try and convert them in my mind to what I know works. Please use these things as a starting point for a discussion and not an end point, because you use it as an end point. You'll be disappointed because you're right. They're not done from our perspective. Anna says, IPS people I deal with have no idea about ND, despite most people in their care being ND diagnosed or not. Yeah, you're right. And I'm not here advocating for any particular book or model. I'm just saying these are what currently exist and what are currently out there. But you do have to take it all with a big grain of salt, whether or not it works for you. Balancing mental health and earning a living is one of the hardest things. It really, really is. You, you know, sometimes when I was feeling at my lowest, I just wanted to phone up and say, I quit <laughs> and shut the door. But then when I'm feeling better the next day, what am I meant to do there? 
you know, if you work can be one of the best things to help you recover if it's an important employer, because it gives you that routine. It gives you that purpose to wake up each day. Another thing that I found to be quite beneficial is having pets because they're adorable and cute. And also you've got to get up every single day to feed them and to look after them. So we're almost at the end. Now, the few key principles of IPS, the individual placement and support, is competitive employment. We're not talking about getting you like the most entry level job. You can still get a decent job. Uh, zero exclusion, you know, not being stopped from partaking in any activities, uh, even if you have any other challenges. Attention to clients' preferences, really big one here. This is led by the individual. They have to be the one which says what will work for them. This isn't something which you mandate. It is something which you offer and hopefully people take on. It helps with job search, development, integration of work and mental health. A really big one. As much as we'd like to leave our mental health at home and go into work and pick it up later if we have to, it kind of does come along for the journey. And how do we manage that? It learns about counselling. And again, it talks about the benefits. This is a really big one for myself personally. If I truly can get behind something and understand it, I'm far more likely to be on board and engaged. And also, this book isn't for a short term. This isn't a self-help book. This is for the long road ahead. This is about setting yourself up for success, not just for tomorrow or next week, but years and years ahead. OK, let's have a look at the comments. Jane says, pets are definitely a winner. Yep, absolutely love them. My cat is fast asleep behind me. We've got uh, Kinga says there's a brilliant book called The Body Keeps the Score and talks about the impact of trauma on those bodies. Definitely worth a read. Thanks for that, Kinga. I'll give it a check out. Jane says, nice to see 2020. So many mental health docs are so out of date. Yes, they are. Um, and that's something you've always got to keep an eye on. Sometimes the most cited books are often the ones which are like the most out of date. So what we looked at today, if hopefully successful, we learned about the focus on personal growth in mental health care, how the individual is taking more ownership on their own journey. We learned about the difference between a personal approach and a clinical approach and how while they are different, they don't necessarily have to be mortal enemies. They can work together. We learn about recovery is non-linear. If you're having an off day, if you feel you've been making so much improvement, but then one day completely resets you to zero, know that that is normal. And that actually means you are on the right path. It's part of it. Expect the setbacks. And it might not feel like such a setback after all. We learn about chime, which is like the most important parts of recovery. It isn't about ridding of something. It's about being connected. It's, in, it's about having hope that things can get better. It's about what you identify with, the meaning and the empowerment. Definitely worth checking out. For me, it really helped me rewire my own internal definition of what recovery is. We learn a bit about overcoming misconceptions. Misconceptions can be some of the biggest roadblocks which stop us from adopting things. Always challenge those like old wives tales. Where do they come from? Who said it? Are they relevant? Are they even in date? Most kind of misconceptions, I don't know why, but all came from the 50s and people never seem to shake them off. We've also got to promote hope, empowerment and meaning life. So I hope if you got anything from today, it was about reframing what you see as recovery and to be proud of where you are currently. We also learn that interventions that promote mental illness recovery. We learn about peer support help, individuals helping individuals. We learn about RAP. Uh, we learn about the IMR and the IPR. Sorry, I used the wrong ones there. But we like kind of different approaches that I used. If one doesn't work for you, try another one. Feel free to mention it to whoever you're working with and we can find the right support strategy that works for you. None of these are overly ND focused, but at least knowing that you're able to take that into consideration rather than kind of going in blind. If any of you are currently in employment and struggling with mental health, do know that there is the government scheme, which I talk about most week called access to work, which you are eligible to apply for. While it can't get you things like medication or like high level support, you can get access to coaching and in work support can be really beneficial. If you think this applies for you, honestly, get in contact.
Now, any last questions before we wrap up today? And uh, I'd love to know, did you find this useful? Did you not find it useful? Were there things you agree with? Any things you didn't agree with? Any books or things that you would personally like to recommend? If not, I'd say job well done here. And what I will also say, if things pop into your head later, always feel that you can reach out to me and I'll happily get in contact and uh, share my two cents. Oh, Kinga says this was very refreshing. Those topics should be more popular. Thanks, Kinga. Appreciate it. Now, if you found today useful and you're like, I want to learn more about this. Our next webinar, which was previously, but I had to delay it due to unforeseen circumstances, but well worth it, is the rise of the expert by experience. And this really complements this session. If you found this useful, this session is going to really complement it. This is about individuals taking control. We talked about peer-to-peer -peer support, and now we're on about those peers becoming the leaders in the area. So an example is Temple Granding, she has autism, and as a result, she is the expert in it, at least from her own perspective, and how she has used that personal perspective to help others. Exceptional individuals were built on the foundation of experts via experience, and we're going to be learning the pros of this term, but also the cons. Do clinicians and medical professionals support the movement, or are they against it? So do check this out. Oh, thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Anna. Always appreciate it. As I said, this webinar will be edited and uploaded soon. Do check out our YouTube channel and remember to like and subscribe, ring that little bell, and that will be fantastic. And if you have any further questions, feel free to drop us a message at exceptionalindividuals.com or admin at exceptionalindividuals. Or my name is Nat, so N-A-T at exceptionalindividuals, and you are great. Thank you, really interesting. Perfect. Well, another Thursday done and dusted. Thank you so much for attending, everyone. And I hopefully... Look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your Thursday.